Today we will be reading from the books, book of Acts, chapter 1, starting from the first verse. In the first book of Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. And when, we ha and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and the cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Amen. Well, Father, I think of the words of the psalm that your word is to be desired more than gold, more than much fine gold. So help us to see your word as it is a treasure. And we do pray that this treasure would renew us this morning. Father, I think of the psalmist who cries out for you uh, to revive the hearts of the Israelites so that they would rejoice in you. Father, we ask you to revive our hearts through the preaching of your word so that we would rejoice in you. Help us to study your works so that we would rejoice in you. We look to you for help as we study now in Christ's name. Amen. Before his death in 1993, Pastor Jack Miller, who served in the Philadelphia area, he wrote these words. We have a problem. Christians have lost touch with the grand cause. The grand cause has lost its wonder. It is honored on our lips. But the vision of a whole church being totally committed to Christ and what is uppermost on his heart has faded from the minds of many of us. And, but now is the hour of rediscovery and we begin with our own repentance. Join us. We ourselves admit our self-centered pursuit of comfort and this pursuit of comfort again and again and again. It has eaten up our zeal for reaching the lost. We gladly renounce such self-centeredness and we bend our ears to the voice of the ascended Lord. Now I've reworked and simplified Pastor Jack's words into a simplified English, but I can relate to Jack. And I stand up here preaching to you this morning, wanting you to know that I need God's help to repent. I feel like I have been sidetracked. I feel like I truly have sought comfort again and again. And I long for God to use this word to renew me. It's easy to get sidetracked. So many demands in this life. So many things compete for our attention and many good things. We work, we study, we have obligations. We got to pay bills. We have kids. We have dogs who need walks, <laughs> emails and phone calls and meetings and appointments and then we get sick. 
It's hard to keep a kingdom perspective that we ought to have. As we sang earlier, it's easy to just completely lose sight of what Jesus is doing and how he is working. And it's easy at the same time for our priorities to get disordered. We have many priorities. There are many good things we're doing, but some of the things that are of first priority and first importance can get relegated to things that are of secondary importance. <laughs> well, this sermon is not primarily about sharing the gospel, although that is entailed, and I will touch on that near the end. This sermon is about Jesus and his kingdom, because that's what this text is about. But I want to demonstrate from the text by walking with you through it. In fact, this sermon has three questions. The first question is simply this. What's the passage about? I want you to be convinced from the text because for any of you who are familiar with this passage, oh, it gets interpreted in a variety of ways with a variety of emphases depending on your theological heritage. So let us look to God for his help to slowly walk through it and try to carefully understand what Luke meant by what he wrote to Theophilus, with God's help, join with me. Let's dive in. But, 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 before we enter the first verse, I must tell you something else about Luke. Luke is selective. I don't mean in who he dates. I don't know anything about his romantic life or if he was married. I mean, he's selective in the way he writes. Listen to Acts chapter 2, verse 40. After Peter preaches that great sermon, on Pentecost, Luke writes, with many other words, Peter bore witness. Peter could, probably could have wrote chapters, but he selected carefully certain things that Peter said that contribute to the narrative he's writing. Luke is selective in what he records. This historian writes a narrative and he is teaching theology and discipling. Oh, I feel the apostles Paul's heart in Luke. If you've read Paul's letters and you understand Paul's teachings and then you read Luke's narrative, you can see they're teaching the same thing, but in different ways. Through the one, you get letters, and the other, you get a story. But also, listen to Acts 5, verse 12. Luke writes about miracles. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the apostles. Hundreds, thousands. But he only selects some to include in his narrative. And Luke's selectivity reveals his purpose. We need to think about the things he's writing and how he writes them because that will unlock the meaning. That will help us to discern what he's actually getting at. It's a harder to understand what the author is getting at in the narrative when he doesn't concisely state his point in a sentence or two. So I just had to throw that in as we dive into the text. Oh, I love the way he writes. I named my son Luke for good reason. <laughs> Verse one, here we go. You ready? What's this passage all about? Verse one, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, I'm sure there were many discussions and te teaching sessions in those 40 days. You can read about some of those appearances at the end of the Gospel of John, Gospel of Luke, Gospel of Matthew. Mark doesn't give us much. How will Luke summarize all the content of all those conversations and all that teaching? What was Jesus speaking about? He summarizes all of that content with this phrase, speaking about the kingdom 
of God. That is striking. At the end of verse 3, you can see it. Jesus was speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, of all of those conversations now, if Jesus was to, if Luke's to record one quote of one thing, Jesus said word for word from somewhere in those 40 days, what's he going to choose? Well, it's in the next few verses. While they were, verse 4, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, don't miss this. Here's the quote. You heard from me, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Lest you think Luke has switched gears, and now he's talking about the Spirit and not the kingdom, we must not misunderstand what Luke is doing here. <laughs> to help us, look at Acts 2. <laughs> when the Spirit is poured out on God's people in chapter 2 in verse 12, someone asks, people are speaking in languages, what's going on? Someone thinks the men are drunk, and someone says, what does this mean? That's a good question. Luke records it. And here's Peter's explanation in verse 33 being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the father, the promise of the Holy spirit, he that is Jesus has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing verse 36. Therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ so what does the baptism of the Holy Spirit mean? It means that Jesus has been enthroned at God's right hand. It means that the kingdom has come. <laughs> Luke hasn't switched gears in the topic of his introduction. He starts writing about the kingdom. He is still writing about the kingdom. The gift, the, the spirit is a great gift for all kingdom citizens, and it would be coming to them soon. <laughs> That's why in the next verse, look what we read. The, 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 um, the, the apostles have a question. So they ask him in verse 6, So Lord, Will you at this time, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They're curious. He's going to be enthroned. This is the hope of Israel. There's promises of restoration and resurrection. The renewal of all things it starts with Israel. We'll talk about that in another sermon that would sidetrack us right now. But do you see from the text that Luke is writing about the kingdom and the apostles want to know about the kingdom. They want to know about the timing of things and the plan of God. And they say, will you restore the kingdom? Look at verse eight. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses you have a role to play. You have work to do. <laughs> he is focusing on their role in the establishment of Christ's kingdom. Now, in Luke chapter 19, verse 11, we learn that the disciples, they thought that the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So Jesus teaches them a parable. Remember, this is from the first book. And this parable is about a businessman. Any businessmen in here? I know we have a few. <laughs> this parable is about a businessman. He goes on a journey. He receives a kingdom. And then he comes back to his servants and they must give an account for their service. That's the nature of the kingdom. The king departs. And trust servants to do work. And then he returns. Luke has written about this in the first book. And he's writing about it again here in the introduction. Look at verse 11. Two men are there, likely angels. And they say, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. 
I was talking to my kids about this passage uh, this week, and I asked, I read the passage, and I said, do you guys have any questions? And we got talking about Jesus, you know, ascending into sky on a cloud, in the cloud, and my one said, you don't see that every day, you know? People going into the sky, of course they're staring, you know? Like, what would you do? And the angels, what are you looking at? He gave you instructions. You go wait in Jerusalem. You need the spirit. And then once you receive him, ooh, there is work for you to do. I have gone through these 11 verses so that you can see for yourself that the opening of Acts is about the nature of the kingdom. Luke is selective. And he is setting up his readers to make the most of their journey through his narrative. And if you miss these keys, you will be robbed of the riches of Acts. And you will join a long list of people who sadly mishandle this treasure. What a treasure we have, not only in the book, but even the keys to understanding the trajectory of the book moving forward. Now, where will I take the sermon from here? I hope you are convinced and see that this is about the nature of the kingdom. But this is one sermon. I don't have time to go into seven lectures on all the topics that have been introduced here. We've got the role of the spirit, the role of the apostles, the role of Jesus, the timing of things, the departure of Christ, the return of Christ. We got Israel. Wow, we got a lot of stuff. Well, I'm going to choose one item, the most prominent item, Jesus, the role of Jesus. So that's what we will talk about next. That leads us to the next question. What is Jesus doing now? That's a good question, isn't it? I mean, how would you answer that? There's a Sunday school class right now. It wouldn't surprise me if one of the kids has asked that in Sunday school at ICF. Okay, Jesus died. He rose. He went to heaven. What's he doing now? We were singing, he's working. That's so true. That's rich. Now this passage will unpack for us what that means. What is he working at? What is on his heart? Let's get our eyes this morning on Jesus. What's he doing? Well, my kids like Lego. Do you know Lego? You know what Lego is? You put the pieces together. The little figures, little men. There's the head and the upper body and the lower body, three parts. Fits together. Well, I'd like to teach on what Jesus is doing now. You can think of three Lego pieces. There's the plan of God, the word of God, and the kingdom of God. And these three pieces are going to come together in the end. First, I'd like to look at the plan of God. Now, remember, Acts and Luke go together. In fact, the ending of Luke and the beginning of Acts are like hinges. You know what hinges are? They connect a door to a wall. The hinge. The ending of Luke 24 and the beginning of Acts actually overlap. But they give two perspectives on what happened in this farewell, the farewell words of Jesus before his departure. And it's important in our, for our understanding of Acts 1 to also read Luke 24. They are interlocking parts that illuminate each other. So please look with me at Luke 24, verses 44 to 47. And you're going to read about three things that Jesus must do. He's actually in the context. He's enjoying the resurrected Lord Jesus is enjoying broiled fish with his apostles. And he said to them in verse 44, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Pause. Pause. Sometimes you will hear preachers and authors talk about the apostles in Acts 1 and their... 
And a stupid question. They're always asking stupid questions. They don't understand. They don't get things. Ah, 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 ah. No. They are not stupid now. The Lord has opened their minds. They're asking good questions. They haven't received the Spirit yet. Okay, unpause. That question about the restoration to Israel wasn't a dumb question. Mm -mm. He's opened their minds. They're understanding things. Verse 46, And Jesus said to them, Thus it is written, first, that the Christ should suffer, second, and on the third day rise from the dead, number three, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Jesus is speaking about a three-part plan of God that he fulfills. It's laid out in the scriptures that he must die. You remember Jesus in Gethsemane? Father, if it, if it possible, Take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. He is committed to fulfilling the Father's plan, suffering on the cross for sinners. He is committed to the Father's plan, rising from the dead, triumphant over sin and death. And number three, did Luke write about Jesus taking the gospel to the nations in his first book? No. No. But that's what the second book is all about. Jesus will fulfill God's plan. Jesus fulfills scripture. It is as sure as the death and resurrection that he will fulfill God's plan of getting the gospel to the nations. I know many of you in here work from your laptops. Can I see a show of hands? How many of you work from your laptops? What a day and age we live in. I'm about half of you. You don't work at the location. You go, you know, you have a different look. Jesus doesn't stay on earth, though. He goes to heaven. It's not like he pulls out a laptop, but he's working from heaven, but he's getting stuff done on earth. We're going to think about that in a bit. But he's fulfilling God's plan. And nothing we are going to read in Acts will stop him. You can beat up the apostles, you can imprison them, you can kill them. And you will only advance what Jesus is doing. The goal of this plan is to establish the kingdom. And we'll talk about the kingdom later. That's the third piece of Lego. But notice the disciples ask that question again about the plan in verse 6. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? That's not explicitly a kingdom question. It's a question about God's, it is about the kingdom, but it's also a, a question about the timing of things, about God's plan. I'm sure, like I told you, the apostles had other questions in those 40 days, but Luke records that one because it opens the door to teaching us about how Jesus fulfills God's plan. This is the second piece of Lego. It's through the word of God, the plan of God through the word of God. Remember verse eight? He says, no, you will receive power when the spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses. The apostles must bear witness to what they have seen and heard. So when I say word of God, I just don't mean Scripture, in general, no. In Acts, this word that spreads is the witness, the testimony of the apostles. They are the authorized delegates of the Lord Jesus, guaranteeing for others the truth about who Jesus is and what he has done. But it also includes the apostles' teaching. Why do you think Jesus was eating fish and teaching them Scripture in Luke 24? You know, Luke doesn't record Bible, sorry, Matthew doesn't record Bible studies. John doesn't record Bible studies. Mark doesn't record Bible studies, but Luke offers two. 
He wants to show you these guys were trained in how to read and teach the scriptures that point to Jesus. So their witness is the fact that they have seen him. They saw him risen from the dead. They are witnesses of his life, death, resurrection, ascension, and they handle the scriptures and teach people how Jesus fulfills the plan of God. When I say word of God, that's what I mean. The truth we know about Jesus at his, as it has come to us through the gateway of the apostles' teaching. Why in Acts 2 do the people devote themselves to the apostles' teaching? Why not Jesus's? Because that's where you find Jesus. It's through the apostles' teaching. Ooh, this, is, this, this little bit I just taught is, uh, I will come unpack that at length in the next sermon. We're getting ahead of ourselves. But Jesus fulfills God's plan through God's word. Remember, there's a parable in the gospel of Luke. It's a parable of a sower, like a farmer. And he takes the seed and he's just casting it everywhere. It's kind of a silly a story. You know, people who usually cast seeds, they don't typically just, you know, just throw it everywhere, you know, on sidewalks. And <laughs> but in the story, the guy does, he just throws it everywhere. And then Jesus says, this is the secret of the kingdom. The seed is the word of God. And sadly, the word doesn't take root in many people's hearts. I'm aware of that even as I preach now. But Jesus, I'm also aware of this. Jesus says there are good hearts who are open to the word. And they receive it. It goes deep and it bears fruit in their lives. This is the nature of of the kingdom. This is what Jesus is doing in Acts. He's fulfilling God's plan from heaven, but he's doing it through the spreading of the word. And that leads to the third piece of Lego. That is how the kingdom grows. That's how he builds his kingdom. That's how people hear about Jesus and bend their knee and repent of their sins and pray your kingdom come and sing songs like we sang, you know, take my heart and make it your throne. And his kingdom comes in the lives of sinners. That third piece is that he establishes his kingdom. So when you put those three pieces together, what's Jesus doing now? What a great question. Well, you know what Luke says here in these verses? He's fulfilling God's plan through God's word in order to establish God's kingdom. He's fulfilling God's plan, not mine. Because I got plans for my life. He's fulfilling God's plan through God's word to establish God's kingdom. And you'll notice in verse 8, it starts in Jerusalem, it's Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That's like an organizing geographical structure for the book of Acts. So do you know what happens in the book? After the gospel is spreading around Jerusalem, you read this verse, Acts 6, verse 7. Luke writes, and the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem. And then you read chapters of the gospel going through um, Judea and Samaria. And then Luke writes this little comment, chapter 12, verse 24. There was a lot of opposition. You know, James was beheaded, <laughs> but he writes this, but the word of God increased and multiplied. You can behead James, but you can't stop Jesus from fulfilling God's plan of spreading that word to the ends of the earth to establish his kingdom. And it doesn't stop in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. In the book, you will read about what Jesus does through Paul. And that gospel goes all through Galatia. It makes its way to Corinth, Thessalonica, Athens, Ephesus, and on to Rome. And you read this summary in Acts 19, verse 20. Luke writes, this is in the midst of the work at Ephesus, where there was much opposition toward Paul and his workers. Luke writes, 
So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. <laughs> what a kingdom. We're not spared of suffering. No, 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 no. Remember the opening verses? It's after his suffering he presented himself alive. His followers, like in the first book, they're on a road to glory, but the road to glory is a path of suffering. But through his love for his disciples, he won the loyalty of their hearts and they will gladly give their lives to him in honor of their crucified, risen, and exalted Lord. And Jesus does it. He wins their hearts, gives them the spirit, and he fulfills the Father's plan through the word, establishing his kingdom and saving all kinds of sinners like me and all the red and yellow and black and white peoples of the earth who all come from the dust. Have you ever thought about that? The colors of our skin, the colors of the different kinds of ground. Adam was made from the dust. But Jesus, he is saving sons of Adam from all over the world. So that's what Jesus is doing now. We've looked at the question, what's Acts about? I hope you have seen from the text. It's about the nature of the kingdom. And then we picked the role of Jesus asking, what's he doing now? We saw that, well, he's fulfilling God's plan. And through God's word, he's establishing, building God's kingdom. So you should be asking, I mean, I would if I was sitting there. This kind of a sermon hasn't had a lot of applications sprinkled. I'm sorry. I know that's harder on the listeners. I'm doing my best with God's help. And I trust you are too. But here we are. Now the question is, the third and final question is, so what? I mean, what difference will these things make? Preacher, you said this will help us to read the rest of the book of Acts. So, okay, that's an application. That's helpful. But I mean, what if Theophilus got this document, read the first 11 verses, had a family emergency, had to run, couldn't get back to the document for at least a week? What good would it be to him? Anything? I think so. And I want you to think about that with me now. Remember Jack Miller, that pastor that I spoke to you about. And he opened, he wrote a document talking about his own pursuit of comfort. And he had lost sight of the grand cause, lost sight of, and he was a pastor. And he, he, he lost sight. He had pursued his own comfort more than Christ. And he, and I too, confess my sins of self-centeredness, but I imagine in a room this size that many of you are like me and you feel like you've lost sight of what Jesus is really doing now. You've lost sight of the priorities of Jesus. Been thinking more about summer vacation. I know I have been. It's hard not to in winter Belgrade. <laughs> But really, think of Jacqueline or Jack the businessman, Jack the teacher, other kinds of Jacks, not just pastors, normal Jack and Jills, okay? What does it profit people like us? to really think about the fact that Jesus is determined to fulfill God's plan. You know what it does for me? It renews my perspective on what's important. Because my life slowly, as I've been sidetracked, my the great vision for my life as I think about my kids and my family and my ministry and my goals and my gifts and my desires and my needs is truthfully, if you heard my prayer life, you followed all my prayers, you would think, you might think that my view of God's plan had shrink to the size of me and my family. 
you, you, would, you would see that I'd lost sight of the grand plan of God. You would think that I had started to think that, 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 that my life was about my story, that, that, this, that I'm the center of the universe. No. No, this book acts as a renewal document. It helps us to get our heads out of the sand like an ostrich, to get our eyes on Jesus and to see he is working. I missed it. I haven't been thinking about it. And that will, if those seeds of truth go into your heart, the kind of plants that grow, the kind of people you'll be, you and I will start to remember, hey, no, 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 I'm part of something big. I'm part of something much bigger than me in my life and my ministry and my plans and my goals. I am privileged to be able to participate in some little way in God's plan about what Jesus is doing. And that, in some way, I trust and hope will color your color and shape and influence your thoughts, your plans. What country you want to live in. Why you, why you want to go where you want to go. How you want to live your life. What kind of life you want to live. What you, all of this stuff. And I don't know how it's going to work out. But this stuff, it is shaping. It will shape you with a kingdom perspective. And not only the perspective. But when you think about not just the plan of God. But the word of God. As you think about these things, when, I, when I'm not thinking about these things and I get an opportunities where I think maybe I should speak to someone about Jesus, if I'm not thinking about these truths, my zeal fades. I lose boldness. But when I think about Jesus having universal authority and how he is determined to save, I find myself emboldened to just not that I could convince anyone of anything. I can't change hearts. Remember the parable of the sower? You can't change the hearts. But I find myself a little more bold to pull out a seed and just throw it and say, I, was, I heard a sermon on Acts this Sunday. Now, what did you do this weekend? And then someone says, Acts, what's Acts? <laughs> Who knows? You might have a conversation. You're just casting a seed. You can't make people interested, but you might find yourself emboldened. And that will look different in everyone's lives. None of us, we're not apostles. We're not the eyewitnesses of the Lord Jesus. We've got artists, we've got students, we've got engineers, we've got people working for the government, we've got nurses, we've got all kinds of people, stay at home moms. It's going gonna, it's gonna to look different. But you, wherever you are, whoever you are, you might find yourself emboldened to just throw some seed out more faithfully. Well, I hope you see that this does make a difference. Now, I'm not going to conclude this sermon with a speech like Jack Miller, but I'm going to close it with three questions for your prayer and reflection this week on those three items of the plan of God and the word of God and the kingdom of God. And I pray that you, as you, if you, if you, if you humbly do this, <laughs> And you pray about these things. I'm praying the Lord would use these reflections and these prayers to renew your heart in these ways. Here are the three reflection questions. Number one, on God's plan. I encourage you this week to pray, even today, about God's plan. Are my plans truly being made in light of God's? Are my plans being made in light of what God's plans are and what Jesus is doing. Just pray about that. Ask God to lead you and guide you. Maybe some of your plans have not been governed and subsumed under God's plan and what's uppermost on Jesus's heart. Number two, God's word. Pray about this. How could thinking about God's plan and what Jesus is doing now impact my evangelistic impulses? How could thinking about these truths impact my evangelistic impulses? A shut-in person who's hearing this sermon online might think, I'm inclined to pray more for my unsaved friends and family. 
The impulses will work itself out differently. We've got people in here who have been set aside to do lots of evangelism. That's essentially their job right now. I hope the evangelistic impulses will work itself out in more than praying for some of you. But this is a, a reflection question, and I put it to myself. As I think about what Jesus is doing now, oh Lord, how ought that to impact my evangelistic impulses? Is there someone I should speak to and say something to about Jesus? I'm sure there is. God, help me. Hmm. And the third question about God's kingdom. Whose kingdom am I truly living for? That's a good thing to pray. Father, whose kingdom am I? Am I, am I really living to please Jesus or am I pursuing my own comfort again and again and again and baptizing it all in the name of Jesus? I know I do that. Well, those are a few reflection questions. And don't forget that parable in the first book. Because <laughs> if you are convicted of sin, remember this. When the prodigal son has run away and made a mess of his life, when he comes back to the father, the father's arms are wide open. He's looking, longing, ready to embrace his son. Because Jesus loves sinners. Luke 19.10 the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He's happy to save and call Matthew tax collector, sinner. He loves sinners, and he is the most gracious person conceivable. So as you pray, and if you feel convicted, oh, may you know the grace of God that will help you to get redirected and have reordered priorities with allegiance to your king. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for the book of Acts. We thank you for this opening section. And I pray for myself what I pray for all those here. That we would help us to truly seek Jesus and his kingdom. Help us to repent of living for ourselves and pursuing our own comforts more than Christ. May the word that we've just heard take root in our hearts and bear fruit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.